All right, everyone, welcome back to our uh, third and final section. And first and foremost, I just want to say um, thank you so much. OK, there we go. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for coming today. And I'm so honored and privileged to be able to kind of share this time with you and share my journey. Now, the title of this section is Coming Full Circle, Making an Impact. And I thought about what I'd really like to share today is kind of my journey and how I've come full circle, not once, but many times and how I've made an impact in my time here at the University of Washington. So believe it or not, this is actually me four years ago in my prom photo. Uh, you might notice a few changes, not many, just a few, but um, I was a very different person. I grew up in a small town uh, in a religious Christian family uh, about 10 miles north of here called Lake Forest Park. And when I was growing up, I started to realize in my senior year of high school that I was queer. And I struggled with this a lot because the type of religion that I practiced, Christianity, it told me that not only was being queer a choice, but it was a wrong one. And so reconciling my faith with this new identity that I was discovering in myself was very difficult and created a lot of internal struggle for me. And when I came out to my parents, they told me that I had forsaken my family, that I had defied God's will, and that it wasn't possible. So it was a very difficult time for me. So when I got to the University of Washington, I was still in the closet. And it was just not any closet. I was in the back of the walk-in closet. <laughs> but I got here. I joined some registered student organizations. I went to a few different events and met some different people. But the moment that really got me was when I went to the ASUW's um, Queer Student Commission's drag competition. It was February 25th, 2010. I was a freshman in my winter quarter. And I'd gone with some other friends that I knew that had been there before, and I was in drag, and for me that was the first time wearing men's clothes. And there was about 750 people, it was in Kane 130, just all packed in there, the aisles were filled, uh, every seat was taken, and they had to turn a bunch of people away, so I was just excited to be there. So the lights come down, and the whole room just goes silent. And all of a sudden, the commission director at that time came on, to, the music came on, and this commission director walks on stage and starts performing in drag. And the crowd just goes wild. Everyone starts screaming, clapping, snapping, hooting, hollering, every excitable emotion that you could imagine is what's happening. And in that moment, I felt acceptance because I realized that there were 750 other people in this room that didn't care what I looked like or who I loved. And that was one of the most radical notions for me in finding self-acceptance. And I looked on that stage and I thought, I want to be that person. I want to be someone who makes events that make others feel comfortable and accepted, but also celebrated and amazing. So after that night, I started dressing a little bit more like this and being myself. And at the end of the year, I thought, I've found myself, but I want to do something more. I want to make an impact in this queer community here at UW. So I applied for the position of the Queer Student Commission director, and I was fortunate enough to get it. And the outgoing director gave me one piece of advice. Her name was Maggie Capwell, and she told me, Jennifer, don't just program to your own identity. Now, I didn't really know what this meant at the end of my freshman year, but I came back in the fall, and I started my job as a Queer Student Commission director. I went to orientation, learned about what I could do, and I realized I had a budget, I had resources, I had things at my disposal that I could be working with. And I realized what she meant, because if I wanted to, I could just bring my favorite author to campus, or I could show only movies that I enjoyed. But my position wasn't about me. It was about being responsible and accountable to an entire community, the queer community here at the University of Washington. And so one of the first projects where I really got a chance to try this out was gender neutral housing. At this time, the University of Washington didn't have a lot of housing options for folks who were transgender, folks who were queer, gender non-conforming, um, or even just gender non-binary non gender folks, or anything in between, people who just rejected the binary. There weren't very many options that were affordable, safe, and provided students with privacy. And so I had the opportunity to work on a task force with those folks from the Residence Hall Student Association, the Queer Student Commission, the Q Center, and administrators from Housing and Food Services. And we worked for two years getting stories and gathering evidence, talking to other schools and figuring out and coming up with this plan about how this would be implemented, but why it should be implemented as well. And so after two years of hard work, 
we finally were able heard or finally able to succeed in this and we heard that we we're going to have gender neutral housing at the University of Washington and it wasn't really talked about it we were really excited to have this daily article but it kind of went by sort of silently but it didn't matter to us because it was a small group of people that came together and were able to affect change on a conversation that wasn't really been hadn't been had before but this got me thinking what conversations are also not being had right now and a lot of you might have heard about marriage this year. Maybe you heard same-sex marriage, maybe you heard marriage equality, and some of you might even heard gay marriage. Now, I don't really like the term gay marriage that much because I don't eat gay lunch and I don't do gay laundry. <laughs> I just do these things normally like everybody else. <laughs> so I'm gonna use marriage equality in this instance. But uh, referendum 74 just passed, and uh, you can now legally be married to a partner of the same sex in this state. And I am absolutely thrilled about it because in life, that's one of my greatest hopes is that I will meet someone that I love so much that I want to make that commitment with them. But this conversation was taking up a lot of space and all I was hearing was marriage. And we weren't really talking about what are the other issues affecting and going on. So this map behind me shows employment discrimination by state and what protections there have. Now these purple states up here like Washington, Oregon, California, some of the other ones on the East Coast over here, those are the best states to live in. That means in those states, you cannot, you will be protected based on your sexual orientation and your gender identity. Now the other states have varying degrees of, of protection for these issues based on either gender identity or sexual orientation or whether you're working in the private or public sector. But not all of them has the ones as good as Washington and some of these other states. And in these gray ones over here, Texas, Florida, Idaho, and these other ones, they have no protections for folks who are queer which means you could not be hired or you could even be fired at any time if your employer found out that you were a trans person or that you were queer, gay, lesbian, bisexual, et cetera. And we weren't really having this conversation when we were talking about marriage. And marriage is something I'm really excited about, but why aren't we talking about this issue that's keeping people from being able to get jobs or keep them? And also, did you know that currently, LGBT youth make up about three to 5% of the current popul youth population, but they represent over 40% of the homeless youth population. And what that statistic tells me, why they're so overrepresented, is because they're being discriminated against and they're suffering from oppression in certain circumstances. And there's not a lot of people talking about these issues of why queer youth are so represented in homelessness. And why aren't, you know, there's millions of dollars that went into talking about marriage, which is great, but we're not spending that very much money talking about why these folks are homeless. And I think that's a really important issue as well. So in my time being the Career Student Commission Director for two years, I realized the importance to look beyond my own identity and think about all the conversations that maybe aren't being had at these levels. And so I wanted to take this to the next step. I wanted to look beyond my community and I wanted to change the way that the communities talk about diversity because I found that as a Queer Student Commission Director, when we had these conversations about diversity at University of Washington, there were often groups and minority groups and diverse groups and communities that were being left out of these conversations. So last spring, my junior year, I had the opportunity to run with this amazing group of people known as the Husky Impact um, and run for the Director of Diversity Efforts. And I ran on a platform of intersectionality because I believe that no one is just someone who is white just someone who is queer, or just someone who is a man. We are all of these things at every single point in our life. You can't separate out our identities. They all influence and affect each other, and we need to be cognizant of that. So I ran, and uh, my ticket and I were incredibly fortunate, and we were all elected together, and it's been a great experience coming into that. And so this year, one of the first projects I got to work on, and I'm still working on, is the diversity requirement. The diversity requirement essentially says that if passed, each undergraduate student would take one class from a predetermined list on diversity that for there'd be three to five credits. Now this requirement is so important to us because we wanted to change the larger conversation. It's important to do work at all different levels, but sometimes if you're working only on small things, the symptoms, if if you, you know this problem that you're working on is a tree and you're just working on just the branches out here, you're not really seeing the whole thing. But if you go to the root, to the base of the tree, and you affect change there, it's a lot easier to change a bigger thing. So I've been so fortunate and privileged to be working with the Student Diversity Coalition on this because we want to change 
the way that people talk about diversity, because diversity is one of the University of Washington's six core values, and in order to gain acceptance here, we have to write an, a, a statement on our admissions application on diversity and the importance of it. So why don't we follow up that conversation? Because the world around us is only growing increasingly diverse. The places we live, the communities we interact with, and where we go to work. So we want UW students to be fully prepared for these and ready to have these conversations and interact with all these amazing people. So the diversity requirement is something that I'm still working on, but I'm very optimistic because this has been 25 years in the making, and this time around we've got such a great group of students and supporters, and so I'm, I'm ready for it to pass, and I think it will this year, I, or at least I'm very, very hopeful. So when I started here at the University of Washington, when I first walked onto campus and saw those columns, I didn't know half the things I know today, maybe even a tenth of the things. At that moment, I was just struggling to find acceptance for myself. I couldn't even fathom the notion of looking beyond my own identity in a community or trying to change an entire conversation or a community and a culture and how we talk about something as big as diversity. But through these transitions and coming full circle multiple times, I've learned a lot. And before I leave today, I just wanted to share one last thing with you. And it's a quote that I found. I wasn't paying attention one day in class. I was on Facebook goofing off a little bit, probably shouldn't have been. But I found this quote, and I thought it was so important because it encompasses a lot of how I feel about leadership. Maya Angelou said, do the best until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. The thing I like about this quote is it encompasses two things I find that are so important in trying to make an impact and working with diverse communities is that you're not always going to know what's right. We're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. And you're not always gonna know where you should be going or how to get there. But it also says that there is an opportunity to learn. And if you have an open mind and are ready to learn and acknowledge that we can't always be right in these situations, then we're all on a great path to being able to make an impact and become better leaders. Thank you.